Hi, uh, today we're going to begin our presentation on gRPC, uh, the story of microservices at Square. And I'd like to first uh, introduce to you Manik. Hi, my name is Manik Sertani. I work in infrastructure at Square and I'd like to talk about gRPC. And my name is Alan Ho. I, am, uh, I lead our developer evangelism at Apogee. Uh, I'd also like to let you know that we have uh, a community page and we will also be uh, putting this uh, slides up on SlideShare and you will also be able to view it on YouTube. Excellent. Thank you, Alan. Yes, like I said, my name is Manik Sertani. I work in infrastructure at Square. I'm going to talk about gRPC and what I'm going to talk about today is a brief overview on what it is. Um, I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, some ideas around how we actually, why we actually built it, why, why we thought it was an important thing, and why it's probably important to you and why you should care. So to kind of get things started, um, Square is kind of famous for the little, little dongle that you see on that phone over there, kind of add that to your smartphone, swipe it, take payments. Anybody who has a smartphone can now take payments, right? So that was what Square is famous for. But this sort of entailed that a lot of our traffic, a lot of our transactions were mobile to server communications. So um, when Square first started, of course, we love um, JSON over HTTP, just like many other mobile apps. Right? It's an industry standard. It's how mobile apps talk to servers. It's easy to route. It's easy to reason with. A lot of platforms support it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A good, quick question. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the G in the GRPC stands for? Let's leave that for the end. All right. No surprise there. <laughs> so at Square, when we first started building out our stack, um, we also uh, used monoliths. Uh, well, we don't really have monoliths. You can go to that link over there to find out why. But this is a fairly common pattern. A lot of companies start up building all of their server-side wizardry, all of their back-end wizardry, as one large application. Um, we found out that that didn't scale over time. Over time, as we added more complexity, as we added more size, traffic, volume, etc., that one monolith became very hard to manage. So we preferred microservices. Microservices made it easier for us to scale, both in terms of traffic and volume, both in terms of reliability, but also in terms of the number of people committing to this code base, the number of features we were adding all the time. Um, so we moved from this monolith to this very tasty stack that we run today, which comprise of Java, Ruby, and Go applications as well, all talking to one another. Um, roughly around 500 of them right now, so quite a lot of them. And I got some questions about from a scaling standpoint. Are you saying that these are 500 individual services? Absolutely. Well, over 500. That was the last count, which was maybe a couple of months old. Okay. Well, we're adding and, new services all the time. And how, how big are these clusters of services typically? A typical service that we run, we run on at least three nodes for redundancy. Yeah. Uh, at least in two data centers for redundancy. But that's probably the smallest size. Even if it's a very, very tiny service, we'd run it in at least that many servers. The larger ones are way bigger than that. And can you like kind of give a sense of scale, like the the largest, especially the the fleets that are managing the uh, online the online services? Uh, those are things I can't talk about. Okay, <laughs> but it's very large, I yes, assume. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So to build services like that, we needed a form of uh, something that was platform agnostic, a mechanism of communication across these services. JSON over HTTP is fine. That's how we started out. That's how our mobile clients were talking to all of our server-side wizardry. So it made sense for our servers to use JSON over HTTP to talk to one another as well. But we quickly realized that they were inferior compared to binary protocols and type-safe message formats. So we built something called Sake. Um, Sake is a proprietary Square RPC framework. We built this a few years ago. It's based on Google's Stubby, which again kind of does the same thing. Um, so we've replaced all of our server-side communications with Sake. <laughs> it's got a lot of Stubby DNA. It looks and feels like Stubby. Uh, and it's all built around protocol buffers. So I'll talk more about protocol buffers in a second. Um, but these are some of the important things that, st that Sake gave us over JSON over HTTP. Asynchronous communications, even though we had blocking APIs. We also had non-blocking APIs too, so that's quite cool. Uh, deadline propagation. So when you're making a call that's several services deep, you want to make sure that deadline's propagated through. You don't want to have a very coarse-grained, pre-configured sort of timeout, because uh, that, that's not valid once you go several servers deep. 
um, ACOs for security, who can call into what, who can do what, all of that was built into the RPC framework. Um, and other things like service discovery, very important, where you have uh, multiple services that are coming up and going down all the time. We're dynamically adding to the cluster of services. You're trying to route across different data centers. Service discovery is hugely important. Uh, they are all orthogonal to RPC itself, of course, but it's nice to have a framework that lets you plug that in very easily. So we started building Saki for Java and quickly then ported it to Go. Uh, Ruby support is uh, still there as well. It's, it's not as mature as the Java and Go support. So most of the Ruby functionality is, is achieved via a sidecar process. So basically a separate Java process that runs in the same server as the Ruby server, mm -hmm. with, and the Ruby server talks to the Java implementation. And, and I got a couple of questions. Like, you know, um, Square is obviously a large tech company. Why did it decide to build its own, even embark on building its own kind of uh, uh, networking slash microservices framework? So that's a very good question. Uh, the state of the art at the time really was JSON over HTTP, which was very, very basic. So there was nothing else really available. Um, a lot of the state of the art that was not open source was, was locked into other companies like, like um, Stubby at Google, for example. We, we couldn't use that. Yeah. We'd love to have used that, we couldn't. So we decided to build something very similar. Um, and we've been using Sake for a while at this point and realized that Sake needed to need a bit of modernization. It was, it was getting a little bit old. Um, we put together a very basic version of, of Sake originally. So we wanted to add things like move, moving the back end to Netty to make proper use of NIO. Um, and you also wanted to open source it. Yeah. We wanted to open source it and share it with the world so we wouldn't ever have to build it again. Uh, and nobody else would have to build it again either. Yeah. Uh, and we wanted to move to HTTP2 and um, you know jump onto a lot of the benefits of HTTP2, <laughs> like bidirectional streaming um, and things like that. That's actually a really good point because, um, especially for tech companies that are really deep in, diving deep into microservices, I personally think they have to go build their own stack in some way or form, whether it's taking off uh, open source and customizing it, because you're just not going to get the kind of performance you need uh, especially at a large enterprise. So when I was at Amazon, we had a, uh, a customized one called Coral, a very similar thing, and it's focused on binary uh, transfer. And it's especially useful, especially when you get into the scale of hundreds of services, and especially when services are calling one service after another after another in a synchronous manner. Correct. And um, that was exact, exactly the reasons why we built Sake. But of course, hopefully that shouldn't have to happen again in future. Yeah. So part of the idea was to open source sockets so nobody else has to do this, right? Um, and then, of course, we got wind of a little project called Arquire at Google. Essentially, Google were basically trying to open source Stubby at this point. Mm -hmm. um, for various reasons, including patents and other things, uh, Google couldn't just go and open source uh, Stubby. They had to actually rewrite it from scratch if they were going to open source it. And that's what Arquire was, taking all of the lessons from Stubby, Essentially, Aqua is Stubby 2.0, mm -hmm. except open source. And it had all the same things that we had in Sake. So it was protocol buffer based, it was based in HTTP2, they were going to open source it. And this is when we, when Square reached out to Google saying, hang on a second, we're doing that. Oh, you're doing that? Hang on, let's just do it together. And that's kind of where gRPC was born. Um, Stubby, basically, Stubby leading on to Sake, leading on to Arquire is all, the pre all precursors to gRPC. So the G in gRPC stands for... <laughs> so gRPC is a recursive acronym. It's the gRPC RPC framework. Ah, so better, it should probably be called gRPC squared if it is. It could be, yeah. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. So let's dive into gRPC now, shall we? So let's talk about some of the features of gRPC. Um, gRPC gives you... Um, a request response style scalar um, architecture, if you will. A single response, you, get a, you pass in a single request, you get a single response. But it also supports a vector style of, of working with data where you can stream data back and forth, mm -hmm. making use of <coughs> HTTP2. It is bidirectional, so that's really, really powerful, um, especially if you're trying to implement something that, that um, involves a constant conversation between two services. <coughs> like one very good example is health checking you want to make sure certain services are up. And you don't always want to ping them repeatedly every second to see, are you awake, are you awake, mm -hmm. are you awake? That's terrible, right? Mm -hmm. Ideally, you just open one connection saying, just tell me if something goes wrong, will you? Yeah. And just have those responses stream in. Uh, a much, much more efficient way of doing things. Um, so all of this is backed by HTTP2 and non-blocking I.O. 
Um, in a nutshell, gRPC is extremely fast and resource efficient thanks to a lot of this. Can I explain? Can you tell me a little bit more about kind of di bidirectional? Because I think this is an issue. This is something that's been coming up, but does, you can't find that in traditional frameworks, right? Correct, correct. The closest thing to bidirectional streaming was WebSockets. Yeah. Once upon a time, but WebSockets are very restricted. They're only um, scoped to browsers usually. It's kind of hard to use in any other environment. And also, WebSockets don't do multiplexing. So it means that you open a separate connection for every stream that you want. Uh, HTTP2 actually lets you multiplex over a socket as well. So you might you might multiplex hundreds of connections from one service to the next just over a single connection. So you're talk we're talking about a scale increase of maybe a 10, 100x. Absolutely. Of what it's you can far get more resource sockets. efficient. Okay. Yes. And also it's a standard where WebSockets never really got baked as a as a proper standard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this actually has huge impact on mobile devices as well. So, so gRPC has been designed with mobile devices in mind that you actually could use it from a mobile device talking to a server backend. Um, a lot of these efficiencies, yeah, they translate to nice things on the server side, but they, trans they translate to extremely nice things in the mobile world. Things like better battery life, better data usage, things like that. So it makes your customers very happy. And do we have any G like actual apps in the, in the wild that are using gRPC over mobile? I don't know of any right now, but I know of many that are, that are about to start. Okay. So, yeah. A few other things uh, about supported platforms, since you mentioned mobile. Um, apart from Objective-C and Java for Android, of course, there's a, there's a lot of support for a lot of different server-side platforms as well. And I think that's really powerful. It means that you, as you enter this world of polyglot microservices and each mm -hmm. service being built in a different language, best suited to its purpose, um, you still have this one common way of talking to one another, and that's very powerful. Yeah, I think that's really important because that allows you to build a lot of tooling for monitoring and infrastructure in a common pattern, right? Absolutely, especially things like uh, infrastructure that actually spans services, so things like distributed tracing, Mm -hmm. Or things like um, uh, rate limiting or uh, yeah back pressure, stuff like that. that that's very important. So let's, let's talk a little bit about protocol buffers. So message formats are a very important part of gRPC as well. So one thing we did not like about JSON over HTTP is the fact that JSON is very weakly typed. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to introduce errors with version changes and things like that, and you're programming very defensively as a result around it. It's very inefficient. It's um, also not very type safe. That's, that's not very good. So gRPC um, uses a very strongly typed message format. We use protocol buffers by default, uh, but a lot of other, but that can be replaced with other serialization formats as well. Uh, a couple of popular ones today are Avro, Thrift, Captain Proto, etc. Um, and it's fairly easy with a little bit of hacking around to, to use one of these other formats instead. That said, it's still far easier to use protocol buffers than anything else in gRPC, purely because that's what we built it for, primarily. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's dive in a little bit into what protocol buffers are, if uh, folks haven't heard of protocol buffers before. Uh, they're language neutral, they're platform neutral, it's a message format, it's binary, it's extremely compact on the wire, and that's what makes it so good for mobile in particular. Strongly typed, so very good for static checking, things like that. Um, you can generate tests for it and stuff, it's very powerful. And they're versioned, so they're backward compatible. Every time you add new fields to a protocol buffer message, you can still translate them to their previous versions by using sensible defaults and things like that. They're also easily transformed to JSON for debugging. So if you want to log stuff, uh, you're not going to get a binary blob that you can't see. You're actually going to get JSON that you can read and test. And index and search, et cetera, et cetera. Especially you if you could. go into Elasticsearch or anything of those um, Yeah, you definitely could do that. I'm not sure if I'd recommend that. Okay. <laughs> it's specifically a debugging API. So. Uh, okay. It's, it's not uh, necessarily the most performant to translate from JSON to protocol buffers and back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So that's kind of what a protocol buffer definition file looks like. In the protocol buffer world, you start by defining what your objects are, what the fields are, what their types are, and everything else. So that looks very much like any other programming language. Some, you know, there's a little bit of C in there, a little bit of Java in there, some anonymous programming language that kind of defines uh, structure of objects. Um, this is just, of course, a very, very simple example. I'd strongly recommend Go to the Protocol Buffers website. There are lots of far better in-depth examples 
Uh, there's pretty powerful stuff there. So in addition to defining messages, you can also define services in protocol buffers. Now this example over here defines a greeting service. A greeting service defines an RPC called greet, takes in a request called a, a type of request called a greet request, returns a greet response, and it defined what those request and response types are there as well. So as you can see, a greet request contains a repeated field, a bunch of people, person objects, as we uh, demonstrated earlier in the previous example, and a greet response just contains a string and a timestamp. So very, very simple, a fairly contrived example, but you know, something that fits on a slide. So, th so this is interesting because protocol buffer uh, basically is not just the format, but it also defines like how the service, the functions of the service, as well as the messages that go across. Absolutely, right? there are two parts to protocol buffers. The first part is just the serialization format, yeah. which is just the message types, the object types. Yeah. The second part of it is defining RPC endpoints. Correct. Okay. Uh, and they work very well together. I would say like, um, and I, I talked to. Um, um, we 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 also have things like Swagger as well. So, mm -hmm. do you mind kind of like? kind of giving a little bit of a comparison of Swagger versus protocol buffers? Do they do the same thing or something similar? Um, there's, there might be a slight overlap, but mm -hmm. not a lot really. So Swagger really defines um, API endpoints in the sense that it uh, defines documentation for an API endpoint, tells you how to use an API endpoint, and specifically a uh, JSON over REST endpoint. Yes. Whereas protocol buffers is not a, not, not a mechanism of documentation. Um, it's more how servers are built. So let, let's uh, let's try this analogy here. What Swagger is to a human being, mm -hmm. protocol buffers are to another machine. Okay. Okay. So a human being will not necessarily read a protocol buffer service and understand mm -hmm. it, but another machine will. An another service will and generate a stub for it and start talking to it. I think that's a very interesting point because um, actually. Uh, you know, Swagger does is starting to get a lot of tooling as well. Like you can generate SDKs from Swagger as well now. Sure, that's still kind of in. Um, there's definitely documentation out there and some open source projects, but it is probably it's still not very mature in my opinion. Sure. The other thing about uh, Swagger, which it's kind of a knock against Swagger in my opinion, is that whereas protocol buffers seem very oriented towards uh, RPC. Mm -hmm. Right, and you send a function and you get a reply. Swagger tries to do a combination of RPC as well as RESTful, kind of RESTful type uh, uh, services, which makes it a little bit more complicated, and the language itself has to be a little bit more expressive. Sure, sure. Yes, possibly. I mean, maybe there is space for Swagger and protocol buffers to work together on uh, um, essentially defining or exposing um, RPC endpoints, protocol buffer endpoints yeah. uh, in Swagger as well. I think, I think actually I talked with Varun, who is a product manager for this, and he's thinking about putting in yep. Swagger support at some point for yep. gRPC. I believe so. Okay, so we've got to a point now here where we've defined our protocol buffer message. Let's scroll back to that previous slide over there. That's the person <coughs> message over there. It's got a name, an ID, an email, um, and uh, embedded in there I've got phone number, phone number type, so on and so forth. That, the phone numbers are repeated fields, so a person could have multiple phone numbers, mm -hmm. etc. And this is the service that I've defined called the greet service. The greeting service um, takes in a greet request, returns a greet response. The greet request contains a repeated uh, a number of person objects, returns a greeting and a timestamp. Now, these are just the definition files. These are just the protobuf um, um, IDLs, if you will. IDL stands for Interface Definition Language. That's just the interface. Your next step is to actually now generate code from this. Now, Protocol Buffers comes with a tool called Proto-C, the, the Protocol Buffer Compiler, which then generates stubs in a number of different programming languages for you to actually now start interacting with this stuff. Um, here's an example. Um, over here, uh, I'm using Go for all of these examples, mostly because apart from Rust, it's probably the most hipster programming language today. <laughs> so I figured everyone listening to this will actually appreciate that. Um, of course, these are just examples. You can generate uh, stubs for pretty much every other language. Uh, protocol buffers come with, uh, Proto-C can generate stubs for C, for Java, for Python, for Ruby, etc. So this example over here, I've now generated the stubs for my person type and phone number type and so on and so forth. 
And as you can see, I've created an instance of it. I'm, assigned, I'm filling in the values here, filling in a name. Um, that's not my name. I'm filling in an email address. No, that's not my email address either. And neither of those are my phone numbers. They don't try and call me. <laughs> um, but basically, that's what we've gone and done. We've now created an instance of this person type, uh, which I've defined in my protocol buffers, but now I'm actually using it in Go in my application. And it's generated an SDK, kind of a generated SDK. Absolutely. For that. So Proto C, the Proto C tool generates this for you. I mean, not this code, but generates the the actual type in Go. And what are some of the advantages of having generated SDKs versus you know, um, ta you know, talking directly through a networking stack like? Well, it's strongly typed. Strongly typed. Absolutely. Yeah. So you actually have. Um, a type that that you can that your type checker can work against. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean very much to dynamic languages like Ruby and Python. Yeah. But to statically typed languages like Go or Java or C, it actually is a very powerful thing. Okay. I think some other advantages I've seen is um, you can build in a lot of combination of instrumentation, authentication, authorization. Uh, for example, the if you look at the Amazon Web Services SDKs, they're also generated from something similar. Um, they already have exponential back off built into the client. Yes, absolutely. And they take care of OAuth, which is a pain in the ass to deal with as yep. well. So, in fact, I mentioned <laughs> earlier that protobufs are extensible. So at Square, for example, we extend protocol buffers to add things like ACLs for authentication, um, deadlines, retries, timeouts, things like that. So you actually define that in your service. You might say service, hello service, um, is is idempotent and you can retry up to five times. Wow. And okay. you define that in your protocol buffer type. Oh, wow. Okay. So the, your code doesn't have to deal with all that logic. Ah, oh, cool. So let's start up a gRPC server. So again, this is more code in Go. And here, fairly straightforward. Actually, this is more the handler. This is first the handler before we start the server. This is the handler that implements uh, that service that we created, the greet service. So as you can see over here, I'm implementing greet service. I've uh, got a request. I'm taking in a request, and I'm returning a response. I'm doing something with that request. I'm getting the the, the first person. In fact, I'm getting all the people over there. I'm, I'm grabbing all their names. I'm concatenating all their names, and I'm returning a response saying, hello, list of names, and adding that timestamp. Okay. So it's a very, very contrived example, very simple, but you can actually have as much complexity as you want within that implementation of that service. So remember now, at this point, protocol buffers have just defined the interface, the API interface. This is the implementation of that interface mm -hmm. in my microservice. Mm -hmm. it goes and does this work to respond to that call. And now let's go and build. Uh, let's actually go start the gRPC server. It's as easy as that. This is, of course, a very, very simple example with very few options, but that's all it is. I start, uh, I open up a network socket on a particular host and port, and I pass that into gRPC, the gRPC code saying start a new server, and here's the service that I want to register, my new greet service. That's it. As simple as that. So how you, can you, like, um, because for a lot of people, we're, you know, we're, we're familiar with Tomcat and JBoss. Correct. This seems like a different style of starting services up, is it? In a sense. So, so you've got things like Tomcat and JBoss, which in the past were... Um, always thought of as containers, as a piece of infrastructure that you start and run, and then you deploy your code into it. Correct. Uh, but even within that same style, you had things like Jetty, which were more embedded. You don't start a Jetty server and put things in mm -hmm. it. You yeah. start an application, and within that application, you launch an embedded Jetty instance. Mm -hmm. This is more the latter. So you start your, um, you have a main method in Go and just run something on the command line, which in turn will open a socket and start listening on it and start accepting gRPC connections, as simple as that. So if you have, if you, but if you have already invested in a lot of monitoring for Tomcat, et cetera, like how could I use gRPC and let's say Tomcat at the same time? Would I start gRPC server within my code in Tomcat? You absolutely could. Okay. You absolutely could. I know people who do that, who start um, the gRPC for Java endpoint within Tomcat or within similar services. Okay, so you get you can get the, the benefits of both. Absolutely. Right? And yeah. then you can also slowly transition over to using gRPC2 if you're already on a Tomcat slash... Absolutely, yeah. Okay. But the real benefit of something like gRPC is the fact that it is uh, cross-platform. So you might start with Tomcat and your next service might be a Go service yeah. or a Ruby service and you can now still talk to one another. Very cool.
So that's basically it. That's as simple as it is to get a gRPC server up and running. And now that's listening on that service. Let's start the client. Now this is again a fairly contrived example over here. I'm going to start a client. I'm going to connect to the host where my server's running. I'm going to create a request, pass in some names. After we're passing in the same person object that we created earlier, the one with not my name and not my email address. Um, and I'm going to pass that in and I get, get a response. It's literally as simple as that. Okay. <clears throat> and all these connections are happening over like standard infrastructure, standard load balancers, etc. right? You can point them through standard load balancers or you can add your own custom load balancing logic to it. So um, probably the most common way to do this or the simplest way to do this is if you already have existing infrastructure and existing the hardware load balancer, for example, yep. and F5, um, that forms a virtual IP that mm -hmm. then farms out, fans out to multiple endpoints behind it. Um, you would just point this to the to the load balancer okay. and let the hardware load balancer do its load balancing. Now, of course, gRPC is a lot more flexible than that. You don't have to do that. You could, for example, have um, client-side load balancing logic in the gRPC client itself. Yes. yes. So the gRPC <laughs> client itself allows you to to register a listener, to, re to register an interface that provides a list of servers to talk to and provides the logic as to what to speak to when. And does, uh, does companies like Google or Square look at use some of these kinds of mechanisms? Absolutely. So uh, Square does client-side load balancing, so we make heavy use of that interface. Um, so does Google, from what I understand. And I think this is important because, especially when you talk about microservices, when the scale you're, you're talking about, especially when you're calling one service after another, the number of API, the number of calls just explodes. Absolutely, so and that client... becomes very expensive if you have to go back through a single load balancer all the time. Yeah. So okay. you want to try and remove that load balancer as your single point of failure, as your bottleneck. I mean, you could have multiple hardware load balancers, but that becomes very expensive very quickly. Okay, so this this actually can actually help you save a lot of money, Absolutely, too. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> so let's talk, touch very briefly on actually getting gRPC into your stack. So all the examples in, uh, I've given and all the stuff we spoke about just now, they're all fairly contrived examples, right? I mean, yeah. who really just writes Hello World? I mean, you know, it's, it's always a bit more than that, right? So one thing that's always important to understand that I've always found people um, stumbled with just a little bit is when transitioning from JSON over HTTP to Proto yeah. Buffs, is how do you maintain uh, the different versions of your IDLs? So you're creating all of these .proto files with all these protobuf definitions. You've got to store them somewhere. You've got to version control them. You've got to make sure all of your microservices can see them. Um, so that, that's an important part to think about. It's just a little bit of process, understanding um, where you put them. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, a common pattern that I've seen is you have a separate repository just for your IDLs. So a separate Git repo that just contains your .proto files and that's it, nothing else. And then all of your other services pull from that repo and use those files. Yeah, that's the that's actually the pattern that we did at Amazon as well. Yeah. Very useful because uh, especially when you're sharing it with other clients, mm -hmm. they don't have to look at, you know, all your code. They just focus on the interface. They focus Absolutely. on the API. Another pattern that I've seen um, that's quite popular as well is where you have one repo for your proto files and then you have a background job that runs Proto C that generates code from them. Mm -hmm. And you have separate protos now for the generated stub, separate repos for the generated stubs for each language. So you'll have a Java repo with all of your protos generated as Java files. Mm -hmm. You'll have another repo with all of your protos generated as Go files. And then your actual projects just include those, um, those other projects. So for example, in the Java world, we export those uh, to, to Maven and we can just download those in our builds. Very cool, very cool. So there's that. Uh, we talked a little bit about things like load balancing, using the, the ability to plug in a software load balancer, a client-side load balancer. That's always worth thinking about. Service discovery is, again, hugely important as well because you rarely hard code your service names and where they go to. So you want to be able <coughs> to have some form of service discovery. Uh, Zookeeper is very popular for yep. things like that. So is etcd, console, things like that. So, how, so when you say service discovery, um, there is humans discovering the service, and then there is machines discovering the service. Yes, yeah, so this is specifically about machines. Okay. Yes. So basically, um, by actually having a registry somewhere where your servers, with the actual servers implementing the service, yeah. are, are registered, 
you're able to change that dynamically. Like for example, if you want to pull some servers out of a rotation <laughs> or you want to add servers to a cluster, you do that within your service registry and suddenly all of your gRPC clients are aware of it and can start routing traffic to it. What about like, you know, in a company like Square, there's a lot of teams and they want to reuse a service that exists. Like how do you, how do you communicate which services are available? Yeah. Uh, let me get back to that because that's a very different problem from gRPC. That's mm -hmm. more of a human problem and understanding who's doing what okay. in a sense. Okay. This is more machine to machine. Um, I also want to touch on things like security, logging and metrics, all very important things, all things that uh, gRPC has hooks for. And again, they're all real world things that you probably want to tie into if you want to deploy gRPC in any real world situation. <laughs> you want to make sure you've got authentication for endpoints in that services are allowed to talk to other services. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure things are being logged so you can trace things. You want metrics. You want to understand how your um, cluster is behaving. So these are all things you probably want to hook into. And can you talk a little bit about, I mean, one of the questions that was, that actually we have a, Satya is asking a question about performance. So what kind of like, um, if we add gRPC in the stack, what kind of performance gains do you think we can see over traditional you know, XML SOAP kind of? 42. <laughs> 42? <laughs> There's no real number, but um, actually this is a very, very uh, good point for that question. My next slide actually talks about a little bit about performance. It's, it's very anecdotal over here. This is, um, this is one particular implementation that has seen some pretty interesting performance gains. Yeah. This is etcd. So etcd is is a um, service discovery tool yeah. um, implemented. It's a core OS thing. It's an open source product. Um, and they recently, in, in etcd version 3, they moved from JSON over HTTP to gRPC. Wow. And yeah. they've got a very interesting blog over there about how they did it, what they went, through, what they, their thought process was as to why they did it as yeah. well. And some very, very interesting performance numbers that seem to suggest three orders of magnitude faster, which yeah. is insane. So, I mean, you know, your mileage may vary. I mean, if you get three orders of magnitude for the performance, that's awesome. I think this is the, you know, I think from a microservices standpoint, this is the game changer. Uh, because, you know, one of the challenges with, uh, I've seen, like, poorly botched microservices where because they have one call is making another call to another without having the combination of bi-directional streaming and having you know latency times of measure uh, microseconds, measure microseconds yeah. then you start having then you start having as a developer you start having to think how should i split my service up you, you start using the performance as a concern to do that not actually dividing it by the business boundaries Absolutely. Um, so, for example, uh, as another anecdote, there's a friend of mine at Google who would always talk about building services there where um, the cost of a network hop was always treated as negligible. Yes. <clears throat> now, I mean, I, again, I come from an old school world where you try and minimize network hops because network hops are expensive and you try and co-locate business logic so you're not hopping too many times. Uh, that's right the opposite of what systems like this help you do. Yeah, you literally don't think about the network anymore. It, it is negligible. Wow. Okay. So that's that's that really uh, it's this kind of a game changer in that um, uh, it's a it's a game changer in that you know you don't have to think about it, so you can divide your service teams the way they should be actually divided. Well, it's either that or it depends on what sort of um, on, on how how your organization is built up. I know that another very popular approach is. Uh, if you take microservices to one extreme, that every service just does one very, very small thing. Yeah. So you try and boil it down to that sort of granularity. Whether that's a good thing or not is up for debate, but yeah. It mm -hmm. allows you to try a lot of different strategies in building out your fleet. Very cool. Okay. So we got some time for Q&A, but before that, i just like to let everybody know that we're going to be putting this up on uh, YouTube and SlideShare. Uh, I heard I saw some questions about issues around displaying the code. Uh, we'll make sure that on SlideShare and on YouTube, uh, it's going to be displayed properly. Yep. Uh, and also, we have a community. There's actually a couple of questions asked on gRPC already. But if you have any further questions um, that that come up after this uh, conversation, please um, put it on the uh, community. Let's let's actually ask uh, some of the questions. I have a few questions or questions are coming in, uh, but I have kind of some other questions as well. Mm -hmm. um, one question that came in was, 
what's the advantage of gRPC uh, over HTTP versus gRPC over WebSockets? Well, WebSockets isn't really a fully baked standard, mm-hmm. whereas HTTP2 has now been fully ratified, mm-hmm. and you're going to see far more um, additional tools and monitoring and things like that being built for HTTP2 that you probably won't see for WebSockets. Mm-hmm. So one uh, one example is I know that people are uh, out there really busy building reverse proxies, building internet caches, things like that. All the nuts and bolts that the internet as we know it today has been built on are now being built for HTTP2 as well. Mm-hmm. So you get to leverage a lot of that. Okay. We have a question from Big Commerce. Uh, how do you handle versioning and updating of the clients? So it depends on, on uh, whether you have control of the clients or not. So for example, uh, if you're talking about mobile clients where updating stuff is usually a little bit harder, it's harder to deploy and make sure everyone's <laughs> updating their apps. Um, now that's a whole different case. But if you do have control, for example, if you're talking about service-to-service type APIs and service clients, that's far easier. You just make sure you update everything. Uh, you don't have to update things in lockstep. That's, that's one of the more powerful aspects of protocol buffers. They are backward compatible. So while, you, while all the clients might not see all the new features, they won't break. They'll still work. Mm-hmm. So that's quite powerful. Okay. Um, another question I had was... Um, you know, how would you, uh, actually, uh, one question I had is, with gRPC, um, when we're making synchronous service calls, like, can you kind of dig into a little bit about the deadline thing and why that's important? Yes. So, for example, if uh, you've got an external client coming into one of your front ends and it's got a deadline of, let's say, 10, 10 seconds, it's Correct. meant to respond within 10 seconds, otherwise you kill that connection. That first service might take about a second to do some work and then call the next service, which might take a second to do some work and then call the next service, etc., etc. Now, if each of those connections had a 10-second deadline, if the last service in that chain takes nine seconds, you think you're okay. Yeah. And now you've got to dial back five services. That that original connection's already timed out and gone away. It's too late. Mm, okay. okay. So you really want to propagate that deadline. You want to subtract how much time has been taken at each hop, things like that. So each service knows how long it has to, to process stuff. And then you can also hope that Skin talk a little bit about distributed monitoring, because I think that's something you're pretty passionate about too. Yes, yes. Again, a distributed tracing and distributed monitoring. Again, very, very useful stuff uh, for, for debugging and uh, trying to understand where things go wrong. So again, if you have a very deep chain of microservices, um, a request comes in to the front end, it gets passed around, you don't really know where potential slowdowns are or where things are going wrong mm-hmm. unless you have some sort of tracing, unless you're able to put a tag or something, an identifier on the request as it comes into your system, and you're able to pass that tag all around all three your different services. Mm-hmm. And everyone's logging and things like that with that tag so you can search for it. If all those logs go into a central place, you can search for the, the, the life cycle, if you will, of a given request. And that's a good plug for an open source project called Zipkin. Uh, that uh, It's a great project that you want to look into, especially if you're building mi- microservices with lots of depth. So Zipkin is based, or fairly loosely based, on Google's Dapper paper, which uh, essentially uh, is a standard, not a standard, but a, a, a way of doing distributed tracing. Okay. I believe there is some work around trying to make it a standard, but whether that happens or not <laughs> is yet to be seen. Uh, So we have another question about uh, load balancing. The question is, can you give a brief description and use case for load balancing using gRPC? Maybe the two types, hardware versus software. So one of the things we spoke about earlier was the the simplest way to do that is to point your gRPC endpoint to your gRPC client to a hardware load balancer, which in turn knows which servers to to send requests to. But client-side load balancing, I think, is far more interesting and uh, far more scalable, far more cost-effective as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So gRPC comes with hooks on the client side where you can provide it a list of servers that are available. Mm -hmm. And that list is queried every time a request is made. Um, And that's a priority list as well. So you can then attach that to any other logic that you might have. Uh, to, to say a service registry and things like that so you know which servers are available in the pool yep. you know how much traffic they're handling if you do and if you can provide that information and you can prioritize that list so every call is going to an appropriate server and and also hardware load balancing doesn't quite a lot of them 
just do round robin, but ha- and it doesn't really work, especially if you're doing bi-directional kind of things. You, you end up having to create a persistent connection, which is bad stuff too, right? Well, it depends. I mean, persistent connections are really useful if you're doing server to server. Okay. And uh, not having to to establish connections every time and going through an SSL handshake every time, all of that, uh, it, it's just useful stuff. Uh, but you're absolutely right that hardware load balancers are fairly simplistic in that they don't have a lot of knowledge as to what each server is doing. So especially if you try to establish a bi-directional connection? Well, regardless of bi-directional or not, I mean... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we have another question, which is, is there an open source demo of client-side software load balancing for gRPC? Um, I don't know about specifically for gRPC. There, there might be um, some in... I, I, I was reading about some folks in the community who have been trying to contribute some stuff. It's yeah. worth having a look. Um, but I do know that there is a client-side load balancer itself as a standalone component that I believe Netflix have written and they've open sourced. Okay. And that's definitely worth looking into. And it's fairly, it should be fairly easy to wrap that up into a GR, to hook that into gRPC. Okay, very cool. So anyone out there who wants to do that, that's your, uh, that's your uh, impetus there to go do it. And it can save a lot of money. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so we don't have any more questions that have come in. Uh, I just want to thank you for your time. Actually, one last question I personally have. Sure. You know, a lot of these companies, they would like to have some sort of enterprise support for gRPC. What do, you, what do you see as the evolution of gRPC in terms of being used by an enterprise? Um, at the moment, it's still very grassroots. Mm-hmm. So it's still very much driven by engineers who just want to get stuff done. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, it's very possible that in future someone might start to offer support or something like that for enterprises. But right now, I don't know of anyone who's doing that. But it does have a pretty vibrant community. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But it's very much a grassroots community, like I said. It's very much... Just engineers who want to get stuff done. Okay, very cool. Uh, actually, we have one last question, which is, is there channel security support? So it depends what you mean by um, security. There are various layers to that. Um, it's all based on HTTP2, which means that we recommend it's all run over SSL. So you mm-hmm. have <clears throat> industry standard encryption, like TLS, not SSL. Uh, industry standard encryption. You can use SSL certs for authentication as well. Mm-hmm. Um, for bidirectional authentication, um, in fact, a lot of a lot of companies do that. That's quite the standard way of doing things. Um, beyond that, you can also add um, you can add client side and server side interceptors to gRPC to do ACLs. So ACLs specifically are okay. Fine, we know the communication is encrypted. We know that service A can open a socket in service B. So on the HTTP level, you guys mm-hmm. are fine. But I've got 10 services in service B. Which one do you want to access? You've only got permissions to access two of them, not all 10. Yes. That, that sort of thing. Okay. So you can provide more fine-grained control over who can do what by adding those interceptors. Um, and you typically hook that into whatever uh, repository or whatever knowledge base that you've got to do that. And I think, like, I saw some stuff on OAuth. Is that right? Is that Yes, you could absolutely use yeah. OAuth as well. Okay, very cool. Uh, actually, one last question we're going to take. Um, are there any differences between web sockets and HTTP2 for performance? I don't know if anyone's benchmarked the two against one another, but I suspect you may not see a huge performance difference on a single request, but overall you definitely will because web sockets cannot multiplex over connections. Correct. So if you're just testing one connection, <clears throat> yeah, they might look a little similar, but in the real world you're going to have hundreds if not thousands of connections. Um, and web sockets will involve opening multiple connections. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Monique. Um, this was You're very, very welcome. Uh, insightful, and uh, we look towards learning more about gRPC in the future. Awesome. Go check out the website. Thank you. Thank you.